there again. Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and uh, I'm here with uh, another installment of the Best New True Crime Stories. Uh, in this particular case, it's the Best New True Crime Stories, Crimes of Passion, Obsession, and Revenge. Uh, this is the latest release in my series, um, relatively hot off the press. Uh, Anthony uh, Ferguson is joining me today. Uh, he's a contributor, and you are coming to us from Australia. Hi, Anthony. Hi. Yes, welcome to Perth, the most isolated capital city in the world. Oh, but a city, well, but a, good, I should say good morning, and you'll see it get darker and darker here. <laughs> yeah. A city there's there's a problem. It's, try, it's always fun coordinating with you. I have to get you up early on a Sunday morning. No, that's okay. That's okay. No, we're, we're all grateful for what you do. That's good. Uh, well, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, so how are you feeling? Didn't you did some sort of a marathon yesterday? <laughs> it was a walk. Um, <laughs> we have this thing called the Bibberman Track in Perth, and it goes for hundreds of kilometers. And uh, But I'm doing part of uh, just raising money for for children's mental health. And I, my pledge to walk 24 kilometers in say a week, I walked 24 kilometers yesterday down the Bilman track, 12K down, 12K back. Oh, okay, well, I'm not good on, um, I'm not a kilometers person. What's oh, that okay. in miles? <laughs> I think it's 3.5 kilometers to a mile or something. It, it, so it's not, it, look, it took me about five hours. Oh God. <laughs> That's a little too much walking for my taste. I think about an hour will do me just fine. <laughs> yeah, it killed me. And the only thing you need, the only thing you need to worry about in Perth and much of Australia is all the poisonous snakes. But uh, I didn't see any. Yeah, oh, lovely. <laughs> There's, Australia's always got some adventures around every corner, doesn't it? <laughs> well, we've got snakes, crocodiles, sharks, and serial killers. Nice, nice. Well, yeah, yeah, you covered serial killers in, in uh, the first book on serial killers. Um, but today we are going to discuss uh, a not a serial killer. Um, you wrote a fascinating story uh, called The Gun Alley Murder uh, in, in, this, in this new book. Um, and set up the story a bit for us, uh, the time period, the place, kind of um, uh, give us the atmosphere of what this what, where we where we are exactly where, where this took place and and what it was like back then okay well it, it happened in it happened in Melbourne I, I've got myself feeding back uh, is there a way I can stop that it's sorry I've got myself my own voice feeding back at me oh uh, what's your volume set at I usually keep mine at around 50 okay. ish okay 50 percent or something. <laughs> Hopefully that's a bit better. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. okay. So we're talking Melbourne in 1921. Uh, Melbourne is three and a half thousand kilometers away from here in Perth. And I came across this in the Annals of True Crime because it's just fascinating because it's the only occasion in Australian criminal history where the perpetrator was given a posthumous pardon 80 years after the event because he totally did not commit the crime. Um, so you've got Melbourne, 1920. It's a particularly sleazy part of Melbourne. <laughs> um, it, it's called. It was called the East, the Eastern Arcade, and apparently it had, it had lots of uh, grog shops and other little shops, 70 shops in all. Done this rather sleazy arcade that seemed to attract the worst elements of society, um, and it involved the supposed perpetrator Colin Ross, who was a man with a shady past that had many dealings, a few dealings with the police, but. He was pretty much a minor criminal. He ended up being accused and executed for a, a murder he, he didn't commit. And, and this time period, when, when, when did this take place? This is 1921, so um, just a decade before the Great Depression. But um, the sort of people that, that would have hung around this area were sort of the criminal types, prostitutes, uh, low-level criminals, people of ill repute. I, I got the impression reading the story that it sort of had this Old West feel to it, sort of the Australian Old West and something well, that here in like North America we would think of as, as the American West. But No, that's more of um, 19th century Australia. This is very much right in the heart of Melbourne. 
so uh-huh. very much an urban uh, city landscape. Uh, and of course, it involved a child murder, which is which is never very pleasant. Very pleasant. Sorry, my cat's well, trying to <laughs> Is that what, the, that's what happened? Well, I was thinking, because I mean, what, this is sort of a saloon, this, this, this establishment where all these events take place is this saloon and there's like the uh, saloon keeper and all these characters. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah, I think the term saloon is a bit of a misnomer. It was just called the Australian Wine Saloon, which is a pretty boring name for a pub. I mean, they usually call the, the, the butchered carcass or the slaughtered lamb or something. But yeah, so don't think of a Wild West saloon. Just think of a, a traditional Aussie pub full of um, full of lowlifes. And drugs. Full of low lights. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the, the gun alley. I mean, that this is it was actually on an alley. So we had all these these characters and yeah. and, and people lurking around at all times, right? Exactly. Of course, the, the the gun alley, I believe, was the strip that ran the alley that ran behind so, several of the businesses, and um, so it was literally an alleyway, and that's where they found the body of this unfortunate girl on the uh, the, and, and, the morning of December thirty first, nineteen twenty one. Right, right. And so this, this. Uh, tell us who the uh, the murder victim. Uh, uh, who is she? Okay, her name was Alma Tersh. So uh, obviously, um, uh, probably, possibly, in a family of Eastern, Eastern European immigrants, I'd say. Um, she, her father was working out in the bush um, to to raise money to to bring her and her her younger sister over to to live with him, out to live with him, and she was living with her paternal grandmother. Uh, she was 12 years old, going on 13. Uh, she was quite a shy, repressed girl, according to her family. Quite had, had quite a bit of a sheltered life. And on the, uh, the the day in question, December 30th, her grandmother sent her on an errand to go and pick up some meat from a butcher in in the city, and then deliver it to her aunt. And unfortunately, she never made it because somebody absconded her and uh, sexually assaulted her and strangled her. And her body was found washed and um, semi-naked in this alleyway the following morning. It sounds then uh, the body was washed, so that's sort of not exactly an impromptu killing. It sounds as if whoever killed uh, Alma uh, had a little knowledge about what, the, what, what he was doing? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't a, 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 an impulsive crime, and the, and the, the perpetrator had time to... Um, to try and uh, remove the, the the evidence, but unfortunately, the uh, the police were led to Colin Ross because he operated a rather seedy bar, and he had a history of run-ins with the police. And there were um, three witnesses, and one in particular, who um, who had reason to um, to want to implicate him in this crime. And the main reason was revenge. Mm. Yeah, you you actually um, in in the story you've got um, uh, the, the 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 there's like three characters involved, right? That all of all of whom uh, are rather dodgy in their motives, right? So we, uh, tell us who these characters are. Certainly, yeah. The ringleader was um, a lady called Ivy Matthews, who was the manageress of the uh, the bar, the saloon, until she was fired uh, a couple of months earlier. And I'll get into that detail. Uh, so she had reason to, to seek revenge on the Rosses and Colin in, in particular. Uh, the other two were was um, Olive Maddox, who was a local prostitute, estranged from her husband, who was a friend of Colin's. And the other gentleman was a, a petty criminal called Sidney John Harding, um, who spent some time in the lockup with, with Colin after his, his arrest. And who, who alleged that Colin told him a sto- the story about m- supposedly murdering this girl. But uh, Matthews was certainly the ringleader. Um, and as manageress of the bar, now apparently the, the Rosses there was Colin and his brother Stan ran the bar. Their other brother Ronald, Ronald did the books but did not appear in the bar. But uh, Colin and Stan had a system where they would um, serve anyone in this bar to the point of in- extreme intoxication. Now, the bar had a bad reputation even in the even in the um, the Eastern Parade, and all the other most of those shopkeepers wanted this bar shut down because the toilet block was across the hall across from the the, um, the pub. The pub had no toilets, and so patrons would be outside, sort of staggering around, insulting passers-by and threatening them, trying to, to wind their way to these toilets. And um, the bar was actually going to be shut down on New Year's Day, 1922. So. Um, there was that issue. There was um, 
uh, a reason why Ivy Matthews was, fi was fired from the bar. And that ha uh, arose from an incident that happened a couple of months earlier. So I should say that the, the Ross boys had had a scheme going where they would pick out a certain client and, and uh, make sure that he was totally intoxicated so they could lift the wallet from them. And usually these people were low lives and they, they, would, they wouldn't try and exact revenge they, or they wouldn't even remember the incident, just know that they'd spent all their money. Now, apparently, uh, Ivy Matthews was in on this deal, though that was never proven conclu conclusively. But she used to point out an appropriate um, victim to the boys and then they would um, sort of escort him across to the lavatory block and remove him of his money. Uh, what happened in this particular occasion in October of 1921 was that this happened. That there was a gentleman in the bar that was completely intoxicated, and um, Colin pulled a little scam. He, uh, sorry, it's my cat again. He, he, um, Ivy pointed out the um, the uh, victim to Colin. Colin had befriended, um, as he did with many people, a, a, a large young specimen in the bar who was, I say, a, a would-be criminal named. Um, Hardy, Frank Hardy, and uh, he said to Frank, um, he handed Frank a revolver after he'd removed the drunken patron from the premises and said to Frank, go over and he's got a big roll of cash on him, go over and lift the cash, take this gun, if it gives you any trouble, and bring me the money back. Now, there is a lot of conjecture as to what happened here. Uh, Frank went over to the uh, toilet block where the, the guy was laying, um, accosted him, but the guy resisted. Uh, the gun went off. The victim was wounded in the shoulder, but not fatally. And um, all hell broke loose. Shopkeepers from all around came running. Frank Hardy ran off. Allegedly, he lifted the money, the money roll off this guy and ran. And um, Colin came over and he called an ambulance for the gentleman. Now, the gentleman in question, the victim, was not badly, badly hurt, badly wounded. And he recovered okay, but because he was paralytic, he couldn't remember any details of what happened to him. So he couldn't finger anyone for the crime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Cat. <laughs> True crime but, kitty. <laughs> yeah. What allegedly happened was that Colin had, had set hard, Hardy up. He, he'd already lifted the money off this guy beforehand. Now, um, Ivy Matthews, thinking something was a bit amiss here, she went and spoke to, her, to Hardy about this, and he said that uh, he didn't have any money and that um, Colin had double-crossed them, and she believed this guy's story. So she went to Colin and confronted him with this. And uh, he gave her £10 and said, uh, go and pay for Hardy and his girlfriend to, to get out of Melbourne. But at that point, of course, um, Hardy was arrested. Colin was arrested. Uh, Hardy had no money and couldn't uh, afford any bail because she couldn't give him that £10, so she kept it. And uh, Colin has said to Ivy Matthews, I'll, I'll take that money out of your wages later. But um, they, they all went to trial over the matter. Um, and Colin knew he was relying on Ivy to be reticent to um, to keep him out of jail. So in the interim period, Ivy was still employed in the bar uh, before the trial. Um, Colin and his family exerted pressure on Ivy not to, to, to drop Colin in it. And Colin exerted reverse pressure saying, if you drop me in it, I'm going to take you down with me and say that and let, let the world know that um, you're actually in on this scam to rip off our clients. So I was sort of like um, in, in, in two minds. But during the trial, she refused to release certain information. And in her view, she helped Colin avoid get put away. He, he did. He got away with it. And Frank Hardy was put in prison. Uh, but at the same time, as mandress of the bar, she started taking liberties. And she was basically blackmailing the Rosses, taking more money out of the till that she was allowed to have. So was that there was that animosity. Now, the day after the trial where Colin was let off, Ivy went back into the bar thinking she'd done the right thing, only to promptly be, be sacked on the spot by Stan, not Colin, by Stan for 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 um, threatening to, to drop Colin in it. So she had that reason to to get back at Colin. And she was the ringleader that rounded up the other two to provide false witness against Colin. Uh, there was also um, at the same time. <laughs> The media were, were, in those days were quite shocking and they'd already targeted Colin a, as the perpetrator. And what they did was they used to report all of the, uh, they used to go and speak to the the people who were witnesses for the prosecution and report everything they told them verbatim, but didn't do the same in reverse for people who were defending Colin's reputation. 
They just suppressed all of that. The media exerted huge pressure on the police to get a result, and the police were desperate to nail Colin, A, because of he, they knew he got away with the event uh, a couple of months earlier, and B, because they wanted the press off their back. So they, too, suppressed certain information in his subsequent trial. And um, Ivy rounded up the other two uh, miscreants and got them to collaborate their tale. On top of this, the reward for catching this for perpetrator of this awful crime was over a thousand pounds, which in those days was five times the annual wage of the average Australian male worker and and a good deal more than what the average Australian female worker was getting. So they had that motive of greed and they did indeed get the rewards split between them in the end. Colin got nailed. Now, um, 15 years after this, when the chief police officer investigator retired, he admitted that um, a lot of the evidence was probably, I guess Colin was probably untrue and that uh, Ivy Matthews was a totally unreliable witness. Um, <clears throat> many years after that, in 1998, an amateur historian took an interest in this case. This is quite unbelievable. He found, uh, he approached the police and found that um, that the, um, the he oh, I need to go back, sorry, there was a, the, the main evidence that um, convicted Colin was that um, in the back of the saloon, there was a, a sofa bed and it had hairs on it, which was used to incriminate Colin at the time because the um, the forensic scientist, which is a very new a, a new procedure at that time, and the guy that was doing it was a chemist that had very little experience, he can confirm that the hairs found, found on this couch belonged to Alma Tursk. And that was the, the, the reason that Colin was, uh, the main reason Colin was convicted and found guilty and subsequently hung in short order, as happened in those days. Okay, but this couch in question had been removed from the bar when the bar was forcibly shut down, taken back to the Ross's home, and then taken into the police station. But at no time was it put away securely. It was just left uh, in a main part of the station where anybody could interfere with it. So this uh, in, the, in the 1990s, an amateur historian called Kevin Morgan took an interest in the case and ended up writing a book about it. And to his amazement, he found that these, <laughs> these hairs this evidence was still in um, police hands. It hadn't been destroyed. And of course, he asked if he could look at it and they gave him permission. And he examined it using late 1990s uh, forensic techniques. And surprise, surprise, the hairs did not belong to Alma Tursk. So as a consequence of that, Colin was completely exonerated. He didn't commit the crime. That's incredible. It's incredible, too, that, that somebody was interested enough all these decades later to actually uh, follow through and, and, and exonerate this man who was, who was uh, hanged for a crime that he didn't commit. Um, Indeed. But what, what's really extraordinary in, in, in these three, the fact that all this stuff was going on, and meanwhile, we have a, a girl uh, pretty much a child, really, who is who's who's raped and murdered, and mm. um, what's what I found disturbing in the story was uh, the sort of blame that was placed on her. That that um, I mean, Colin, uh, in in we have he's there's an implication that he might have been a pedophile, correct? The Ivy Matthews made this implication, but there is no evidence to ever suggest that Colin had an interest in underage girls. No, no evidence at all. No. No, but but she certainly wanted that to, to sort of be the the theme song playing, right? Yes. Uh, and, yeah. and 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 I mean, there was there was an implication here that that um, this this child who was at the bar was uh, uh, up for it, essentially. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In the supposed confessions that Colin made to the uh, three people in question, which which quite probably never happened, uh, he admitted that he. He liked young girls and that he he was feeding her alcohol and then he lost control of himself and sexually assaulted her. And um, at some, some people, some, some allegations claim that uh, she was uh, semi-conscious and when she started to wake up, he panicked and strangled her. Um, what really happened, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll never know, but there, um, as this, this amateur historian found out, that there was um, an estranged husband of a cousin of, of Alma's who quite probably was a pedophile. And um, 
other like other witnesses who were suppressed during the trial had said that they'd seen a man tailing Alma down the street and that she was keen to avoid him. And it's possibly why she she wandered into that alley. And Colin had admitted that he saw her from his doorstep of the bar, but that she never entered the bar. But at the same time, children were often seen in this bar with their with their parents. So it, so it's quite possible that people had seen school children in this bar before. But it's going back to this, the likely perpetrator. Well, I did a bit of research, and if it was a serial killer, child serial killer, there's never any evidence of any other victims before or after this. So I think we can rule out it was a serial killer. Uh, more likely it was his pedophile uncle because Alma's younger sister in later years would claim that he had tried to molest her as well. Um, now, Alma's family were one of the, uh, the main groups who actually defended, spoke in favour of Colin and said that there, there's no way that Alma was promiscuous. She was, um, she was a very shy girl and she would never speak to strangers. She'd been taught that, but she would speak to a family member. And if this uncle approached her and sort of like forcibly led her away, it's likely she wouldn't have resisted. Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. But I, I mean, you have to admit this, this, uh, it, it, it's, 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 is it Ivy, the one who he, she was spinning the pedophile story? Uh, you yeah. have to really wonder this, this, what kind of person this was that she would even, uh, you know, get this out there. I mean, this, this is this, this yeah. is a child and then to try to, in a way, uh, make out as if, you know, she was this yeah. temptress. <laughs> It is horrible, and I, I can only assume she was some kind of manipulative sociopath. Apparently, uh, she put on a big act in the uh, the court when the uh, Collins defense team like, had accused her of certain things. Like, apparently, she was estranged from her husband. Uh, there was never any proof she really had a husband, but she was drawing on three war pensions from, from the First World War <laughs> under different names. Um, okay. And as I point out in the article, she was the ringleader and rounded up these other two miscreants and got them all to collaborate, corroborate on their stories. And in later years, I mean, she reappeared in the 60s uh, when she was um, getting quite on a bit as a as a um, backyard abortionist because abortion <laughs> was illegal in those days. And she was about to go to trial after being um, pinched by the police for that when um, she had a series of heart attacks and passed away. But, yes, look, at, look it was a horrible thing to do um, based on the motive of revenge and the greed for that incredible amount of money. I mean, they should never offer that amount of money. Apparently, that amount, that um, figure was second only to the uh, reward for the notorious uh, Ned Kelly gang. Wow. Uh, in Australian history. Yeah. <laughs> I that's, don't know what the equivalent that of that is today. But yeah, that's like a half a million dollar reward in today's money. So. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, it's a, it's an incredible story. And, 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 and all these pieces that are fitting together, all these dodgy characters, I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, you could... It almost seems fictional the way these these mm. characters are, um, but uh, just we're actually going to uh, segue because we're going to do a two for one today with the next book. But uh, we have been discussing the Gun Alley murder, which is Anthony Ferguson's story in the best new true crime stories: crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. Um, so we're going to move on because uh, I didn't get to talk to Anthony last time when I was covering the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. And he's in that as one. well. <laughs> yeah, you got that yeah. one. The other one will probably arrive in the post next week. I hope so. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. They, they, you know, they'll get there eventually. They'll get there eventually. Um, but uh, so we're gonna so it's gonna take this opportunity since we got Anthony up on a Sunday morning <laughs> to talk about his story, um, Alan Bond, the Aussie larrikin who went from rags to riches and back again. Uh, mm. This is quite a departure from the story that we've just been discussing. I mean, we could say it's a, a bit <laughs> definitely a bit lighter, but. Um, Tell us, okay, who is Alan Bond to those who do not know Alan Bond? Yes, I mean, if you're not from Australia or Western Australia, you wouldn't really know of Alan Bond. Uh, famous entrepreneur in um, Australian history, a corporate criminal, um, a working class guy who made good. Uh, Bondi, look, I first encountered Bondi when I was a very young backpacker going around London. And one night I was just wandering the streets and I heard this great commotion coming from a bridge over the River Thames. Must have been close to Earl's Court where all the Australians hang out. And I moved closer and I, and I saw all these people partying and they're all drunk and they had those stupid 
cork hats on that, <laughs> like in the movies, that Australians. I've never seen an Australian wear a bloody cork a hat with corks on it. But anyway, they had all these cork hats on, and I, was, I went up to one and said, "What's going on?" And he said, "Oh, mate, we won the bloody America's Cup." And I said, "Well, what the hell's the America's Cup?" But I would learn. Yeah, um, it was a, a yachting competition for uh, wealthy elite snobs. But um, Alan Bond, okay. Bondy was a poor boy, boy made good, emigrated from London, came from Hammersmith, um, grew up in Perth, was an apprentice sign writer. Uh, in his own words, was brilliant at school and a brilliant sign writer. In the words of those who knew him, he was basically illiterate, could barely read or write, and was fired from his job as a sign writer. But in his, in Alan's own mind, he left that job to start his own um, bond business company, the Bond Corporation. So Alan was one of those guys that... Um, didn't have intellectual smarts, obviously, but he was cunning and he understood money and how to make it. And he was garrulous. He could talk anyone into any deal. Uh, he was affable on the surface, affable, friendly, great guy, great party guy. Behind the scenes, like any really successful millionaire, a ruthless sociopath and a monster. And it didn't get his way. He would, he would scream abuse. He would jump up and down. He would uh, threaten to sue. He would even threaten violence. He would say he would uh, threaten to send people around to sort you out if you didn't give him lend him the money he wanted. Um, he made millions in real estate. He was very clever that way. He in the early 70s he um, he realised he could borrow big on real estate and get out quick and sell it for a huge profit. And the most important thing Alan did was he learned early the value of um, family trusts and discretionary trusts so that he could hide his money and his property and his property in um, these trusts where creditors could never get it. So he was bloody clever that way. Um, unfortunately, he screwed a lot of people out of money, a lot of like um, people out of their hard earned savings. And like some people, marriages broke up, people committed suicide. Alan didn't give a toss. As long as he got what he wanted, he was happy. Uh, so he, yeah, he was a corporate criminal. He rose and fell. Um, a, a, a real con I man. I mean, the, the yeah. kind of things that he was up to. I mean, it's just like classic con man stuff, but with uh, huge sums of money. Huge sums of money. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we see these characters everywhere. I mean, there's there's one in particular I could refer you to that I sort of hint at in the in the book. Oh yes, American yes. yes yeah. First person I thought of like... when I read your submission. <laughs> Yeah. We, yeah, we'll just say the initials DT and leave it at that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And they, right, well, they, tell, tell us some, some of Alan's favorite scams that he ran, because I mean they were scams. He he kept making himself richer, but I mean it was like as you keep saying, he kept borrowing other people's money to get richer. He never used his wrist anything that was his own. He did. He did. Well, I was actually going to go into a little detail about the America's Cup of that, because this is a fascinating oh, sure. case of Alan's personality. OK, so obviously um, in the early 70s, Alan, Alan realized that he, he, he'd noticed that um, that the uh, the very wealthy and the elites were um, interested in this pursuit of yachting. Uh, and there were always the, the high flyers in, in society. Like so he, he, he cottoned on to these people in Perth. And he realized if I can get in with these people, I can make loads of big money deals. So that was why Alan got into yachting. Now, the America's Cup was a competition that started um, in England um, so about 150 years earlier. But the Americans had won it, and it became the exclusive domain of the New York Yacht Club. And they held this trophy for 150 years. And nobody gave a damn because it was only the uh, guys that were interested in chasing it. And then Alan. In the early 70s, Alan started pumping money into um, into trying to win this America's Cup off the Yanks. And it became like, when he was this, Alan was the sort of guy, once he got his teeth into something, he'd never let it go. So um, Alan had a crack at this cup in, in 1970. It was every, every three years. 1974, failed. 77, failed. 80, failed. But he wouldn't give up. And his tenacity was one of his, his great, great traits. So Alan came back in 83. And uh, this time he came back with a um, secret keel on the yacht. And this was done beautifully, like it was all subterfuge and the keel was never revealed to the public. Whenever the yacht was transported anywhere, the keel was covered over with a big, big uh, strapped on tarp. And um, you, Alan used this to sort of like um, to get people interested in the cup, which because ordinary Australians didn't give a toss about 
what the, the wealthy did with their money if they weren't getting hold of any of it. So Alan had this secret kill uh, designed by a guy called Ben Lex and um, Alan and Ben are no longer with us. And he had a good skipper. Um, there were always a series of races, even amongst the holders, to, to determine who was going to defend the cup. And quite often through the 70s and 80s, it was a guy called Dennis Connor from the York Yacht Club, who again was a brash, loud-mouthed uh, rich guy. And in Australia, Bondi's team beat off all the, all, sorry, around the rest of the world, Bondi's team beat off all the competitors with their wonderful win kill, because apparently it's, um, it was a great, great yacht and it was quite fast. So they, they got it over to New York in complete secrecy, with the keel in complete secrecy. Alan ensconced himself, this is brilliant, Alan ensconced himself amongst the local elite New Yorkers, but he played the role of a poor, downtrodden, working class Aussie battler. And he was loud and he was brash and everybody noticed him. Now, the Americans hated, the rich Americans hated him, but Aussies, like um, in Australia, West Australia and, and the rest of Australia, cotton on this and thought, oh, this guy's great. He's, he's a working class sporting Aussie hero. He's going to stick it up those yanks. So they were all behind Alan. Alan ingratiated himself with us and um, he annoyed the Americans. When it came to the race, it didn't go so well from the, from the start. I think they won one of the first white races, but then Dennis Connor started to cane him. And it was just, it's always a best of seven series. So after four races, um, Australia 2, the yacht, was 3-1 down. And in the in the uh, fifth race, um, was trading by a long way. And it looked like Alan was going to fail again. But by some miracle, this Australian yacht pulled back and won the race. It was 3-2. And it won the next race. It was 3-3. Three, three. And it won the next race. And it was 4-3. And it was an Australian sporting miracle, which Alan traded off for the next 20 years by ingratiating himself with um, with all the rich and powerful, the politicians, the businessmen. And he must have made an incredible amount of money and got all these people to um, to, to give him their life savings, which he would invest. As um, There's a j journalist called Paul Barry who trailed, <laughs> trailed Alan for decades and wrote two books, which I read about um, Alan's rise and fall and subsequent rise again. Um, and uh, I, I remember this one famous scene. I was watching the, <laughs> the ABC News in Australia and Bondi had come out of court where he was being sued by uh, by by everyone because there's a great economic crash in about 1990, 87, late 87 economic crash. And Alan had lost everything of everyone else's money, but he sequestered his own away. And jo <laughs> Paul Barry chased Alan down the street and uh, Alan was shuffling along. And um, Paul said, <laughs> he tapped on the shoulder and said, Alan Bond, Paul Barry here. Do you, you might remember, here's my business card. And that looked at him and he, he dropped the business card on the ground and then he jumped up and down on it and then he turned and left. But Paul Barry says off camera what Alan would do. Um, in the court, Alan portrayed a broken man. He uh, was apparently suffering from depression. He'd forgotten, surprisingly, so much of the detail of his uh, his corporate dealings. And he would sit in the court with his all show in a, in a, 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 a bad suit all hunched up and sniffling with a bag of sandwiches. But Paul Barry used to say that um, as soon as Alan got out of that court and rounded the corner away from the cameras, tossed the sandwiches away, straight the back, straightened, straight back to his hotel, and he was on the phone to Singapore, Hong Kong, the US, doing all these great deals and uh, rebuilding his fortune. So, yeah, look, literally, a con man. But uh, but um, people, people who um, did well out of him loved him. People who <laughs> yeah. loved, <laughs> hated him, yeah, certainly a, a corporate criminal. But well, uh, but quite a, a few deal. lost, though, right? I mean, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, there were quite a few lives ruined from him. Absolutely, yeah. And Alan, as I said, didn't care because because he was ruthless. Um, but Alan's personal life uh, was actually tinged with tragedy. Well, um, um, he was married twice. His first wife um, was always good to him, even after they divorced, because she cashed in big time. And she looked after him when um, he, was, he was allegedly destitute and she would come around and cook him meals. But his second wife, um, Diana Bliss, unfortunately, had um, mental health issues. And she ended up um, committing suicide by drowning herself in the uh, the, uh, the family pool at their mansion, which is, which is quite tragic. And Alan's daughter, um, at the age of 41, took an accidental overdose of her medication. She had some issues as well, and, and she died as well. So, yeah, 
there's a lot of tragedy uh, at Alan's life. Uh, uh, Diana was uh, Diana Bliss was a bit of a celebrity, wasn't she? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. She, yeah, she was. She came from a wealthy background, uh, or a reasonably wealthy background as well, and she was very much into patronising the arts, which Alan was into because he loved to buy up famous paintings where he didn't really care about the art; he cared about their value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, yeah. I, uh, so I, I can see the the uh, appeal of him. I mean, as you're saying, the hmm. the Aussie battler, the, the, the you know this this guy who came from nothing and he basically you know built his way up, although built it on the bodies and the money of other people. Um, hmm. what, so what would qualify Alan, uh, for instance, as a well-mannered criminal? I mean, we've got this 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 prestige of winning the America's Cup, yeah. which is you know, obviously that opened doors and suddenly he's not so loud and brash and obnoxious anymore to the wealthy mm. elite. I consider him well-mannered in that his public face was always very affable and friendly. Um, it was only behind the scenes that he was a monster. And this was a side that nobody really saw in public. Uh, he was, like all um, rich, powerful men, he was a terrible womanizer and he had a... a um, a great interest in young blondes, and there were several of them in his life. And his, his first wife, Eileen, knew all about this, but she was okay with it as long as she had her money and her friends and go party. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah just a terrible womanizer, a terrible father, a terrible human being. But the public face, you know, was this great working-class hero. Yeah, so he knew how to spin his story. Yeah, they, they all do. They're, they're, there are people like this everywhere, and we need them in a... To a certain extent, we need these sort of people to make things happen. I mean, he brought a lot of money and attention to Perth, which in the uh, the 1970s and 80s was a total backwater. I mean, we're still very, I mean, we're geographically isolated. We're, we're emotionally and spiritually isolated, but at least we've moved on a bit now. But but you can thank Alan for, for, a, for a bit of that because he brought a lot of money and a lot of attention to this state. He put you on the map. <laughs> yes, he did. He actually said that when Alan was down, he, again, because of the sort of ruthless person he was, he never blamed himself. He blamed the media. He blamed corrupt business partners. He blamed politicians. And he literally, Alan said, I put this place on the bloody map. If it wasn't for me, no one would give a toss about Perth. Um, not entirely true, but um, he certainly played his part in getting us recognition and bringing in a lot of money and, and development. Wow. Out of curiosity, what was it about, uh, why did you decide to write about Alan Vaughn? What was it that uh, just inspired you to go and, and pursue the story? Well, in, any, in every instance when I'm looking at um, getting into one of your books, I'm trying to find an Australian character that really stood out, so I, um, or an event that, that really stood out, like he had Snowtown. You've got, um, oh, the next one I'm trying to get in is Rol Rolf Harris. So the people, they're people that not everyone in the world would have heard of, but they're huge characters and huge events in Australian in Australian history. Because, you know, we're, we're a very isolated place. And um, when people think of Australians, they, they think of maybe a few, you know, sporting persons, not many political figures. Um, oh, and entertainers, they're entertainers like Barry Humphreys and that. But, you know, most, mostly people ignore us and they think of us as um, harmless yogurts. Which we are, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, you've got you've got wonderful exports from Australia, Kylie Minogue, and, yeah, and, yeah. and lots of great talent from Australia. Yeah, <laughs> See, I need um, to move it, down there. I think it's calling to me. <laughs> you'd probably like living here, but if you if you like peace and quiet, and um, some beautiful scenery and great beaches, and you want and you want to get away from the world, this is the place to go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold. It's just the bit about the poisonous uh, critters that that's oh, a bit off yeah. thing. <laughs> We've got them all. Yeah, with the spiders too. Don't forget the spiders. We've got some of the worst yeah, spiders yeah, you, in the world. You, you, yeah. You've got them all in Australia. They all just sort of congregated there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm. Well, I mean, Alan Bond is definitely uh, quite a character, and and. Uh, Again, that the story is uh, called Alan Bond, the Aussie Larrikin who went from rags to riches and back again. And that is in the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. Um, is there anything you'd like to tell us that you're working on that um, you're excited about or you, know, you want well, to plug um, something? You can plug something. As a, a horror writer, <laughs> um, 
I do have, hang on a sec. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You're going to bring the cat? <laughs> <laughs> My first novel, Protégé, available okay. on Amazon. I'm working on a follow-up second novel, um, uh, and I can't, say anything too much officially but um an australian publisher is going to bring out a collection of my short stories in early 2023 um i have i'm come closing in on 50 stories now in anthologies wow. and magazines so yeah horror stories yeah i love the horror and that's why i research true crime because i find and um and things like that because i find like certain traits of these characters great to to, to reflect on and use in my imaginary characters and some of the events too like true true life is of was often more appalling than um fantasy it, yeah definitely definitely i mean there's some stories in in these books that it says if if you were to write it as a piece of fiction it would be completely unbelievable you know absolutely be, readers the yeah. readers would just say oh forget it you know I, i'm not going to swallow that mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, didn't you do do a book on on, on australian serial killers relatively I did indeed. recently Hang on a sec. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm terrible at self-promotion, and, and I don't like um, really enjoy talking about myself. But this one is um, a history of uh, Australian serial killers. Um, that's actually published in America by McFarlane Press. So yeah, definitely um, check out that one if you want to read about some of our crazy, crazy criminals and murderers over the years. It's very interesting that um, serial killing seems to have died off in the 21st century i'm not so sure about america <laughs> all serial killers there. yeah yeah and i'm thinking no. is it because forensic technology has improved so much because we've got we have one over here the claremont serial killer in perth who operated yeah. in the 1990s now this this was not sold until very recently about a year or two ago thanks to new forensic science they actually got some dna of this guy and they caught him like 20 years after the event he must have thought he got away with that. That's just incredible in my book. Just incredible. Yeah. I can't believe that. That um, they, well, they finally we, caught this person. We're on serial killers. I said cats. <laughs> <laughs> we're on serial killers because uh, that's how you and I first uh, uh, met up was uh, because you uh, wrote a story for the the first book, the best new true crime story, serial killers. Kitty, yeah. <laughs> kitty bum <laughs> in the photo in, in the frame. But actually, oh, funny enough, hang on. Um, mm. I don't have the book to show, but do you know that I finally got hold of the Turkish translation from that book? Ah, yeah, I saw you. So I saw you're that in online. There, you're in there in Turkish. <laughs> Jeez, maybe one day I'll be famous. I bet when I'm dead, I'm famous. Oh, God, yeah, but who cares <laughs> then, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it's like, I don't, I don't want to leave a legacy. I just would like to have a good life right now. And, you know. mm. Do yeah. some good work and and you have a little enjoyment once in a blue moon. But if you wanted, I I, I know there's. It really was a lot. It was a it was a lot of hell trying to finally get this copy for myself. But I think I know Amazon UK's got got it for sale, and I think the bookseller is selling them. So if you wanted to get a copy, you can order it from the from the bookseller in Turkey in Istanbul. So which one is this again? This is the serial killers translation into the Turkish okay, translation. Okay. Yes, so, yes. I mean, if you wanted to add to your shelf of books, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. So put a foreign language section into my vanity shelf. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they did a lovely job. I mean, I'm really, I, I, I think it's really cool. I like what they've done with it. So. Oh, awesome. They even did a well, video. As I said, they I even think, did like um, a trailer. I think you're, you've done, a, you're doing a wonderful job with this series, and um, you picked up a lot of you fans, and uh, you get yourself out there. <laughs> Uh, well, well, I'm, I'm just very impressed with um, the, the whole series. So I, I look for. I'll, I'll even. I'll, I'll even read the ones I'm not in. They're, they're that good. Well, I think. Well, you're in the one coming out after the New Year, the Partners in Crime one. You're in that. The, the Bernies. Um, you're not, yes. The one that comes after that. You're not in that, but you never actually wrote anything for that, so you weren't even no. in the running. And I'm still selecting for that. I'm down to the to the wire with the last like two slots or something. I'm kind of like saying I can't deal with this anymore because I can't decide. Let me just edit a while and then I'll see who's gonna get in, <laughs> who's gonna put a hit on me that gets a rejection. <laughs>
But uh, well, I've, anyways, it's been great talking to you. I've been uh, for those of you tuning in, uh, I've been speaking with Anthony Ferguson in Australia, and he is in the best new true crime stories, crimes of obsession, passion, obsession, and revenge, and the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. And we've been chatting about his stories from both books. And uh, thanks again for joining us. And I'm glad we finally managed to get our sound mm -hmm. coordinated. This time it was Anthony's sound that wasn't working, not yeah. mine. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> me, and it was me. No, me and technology do not work well together. I'm, I'm a sad aging figure. Oh, I don't know. You know, I've got a relatively new laptop. I've got a new uh, modem. Uh, I, I, I don't know what happened last time, but I was yakking away and I'm just like this mm. mannequin with the mouth is going and nothing's coming out. Mm. <laughs> so, just strange. Minute, okay. Very strange. Mm. Well, thanks again, Anthony, and enjoy your Sunday. I will. Thank you. I'm not walking. Okay. No, you're not walking. I wouldn't walk either. Just nap today. After we're finished, just uh, get a cup of tea and, and relax. Oh, I'm not that old. Okay. <laughs> well, I get a cup of tea and relax. I mean, you know, that's right. what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again. Uh, no problem. Anytime. Till next right. time. Bye. Bye. Okay.